Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome back to the Elm Thug Game Channel. I am AJ Gels. Guys, we are back once again with the weekly show. Um, jeez, man. How long... When was E3? Was that last week? Jeez. This is... Re it, it's really bad in the summer, guys. Everything's all rolling together. Um, either way... Uh, if you're new to this program, this is my weekly show here on the Alum Tower Gaming Channel. Basically what I do is I gather news uh, from around, you know, Games Radar. Uh, yeah, Games Radar. I don't know why I couldn't think of the site. Games Radar, IGN. Uh, I got some stuff from UbiBlog this week. Uh, you know, that sort of stuff. I bring, I read articles. I talk about them. Give my opinions. Uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, as we've advanced, I kind of, we watch some videos. Uh, you can find um, all timestamps of everything that I'm of everything that I'm going to talk about down in the description below. I'm sorry, I'm very, I'm slurring my words a lot. I, I don't know uh, what's going on with that. Um, I felt like I had an announcement, but uh, I really don't. No, no, I, I, I remember. Um, I, I know I've kind of slowed down with my uploads. I'm sorry, I've just been in a funk or something. Um, it's just, it's been really hard just to kind of get up and go record. Um, but uh, I'm going to have some stuff up for the next, um, really try and buckle down, get some stuff uploaded um, today and tomorrow. Um, but Monday, I am leaving early. I'm going out to Cleveland for a, for something, then I'll, I'll be back on Tuesday. So, I mean, it's just don't expect anything up on Monday. I feel like there was something else, but I really, I, I really don't have it. Let's just hop right in. Uh, I know, hop right in after, what, how long have I been, after, oh, alright, I'm about two minutes in, it's not my longest intro ever, uh, this is a, uh, look at Beyond Good and Evil 2, and again, this is a game that I don't know pretty much anything about, uh, because I, I never played the first Beyond Good and Evil, so many people have been excited about this game, I've just been going, yeah. uh, but we're gonna take a look at it, uh, I'm gonna stop and make comments here and there. Uh, I actually don't know anything about this game, or, or uh, I've actually not seen this entire 14-minute video. Actually, I'll click that out. Uh, but I've never, I've, I've not seen this entire 14-minute video. I've seen maybe uh, two or three. But, uh, so let's enjoy together and all that. Hi, Space Monkeys. So, we are back from E3. We wanted to share with you that uh, demonstration, which is um, a mix between a technological demonstration of the G engine that we call Voyager, and uh, the actual game with some gameplay elements. So here you can recognize the big mothership that was in the, in the trailer. Uh, of course, it's not the same level of quality. This is a work in progress asset. But again, we wanted to share all these um, this materials with you. As you know, the game is in development. Uh, we still have a lot of things to do, but it's, it's cool to share with you where you, you, we are on that, that um, spaceship part. So here, you, the mothership is, uh, is like a home, a house for the player. That one is about 400 meters long, and you can have your crew inside, of course, your main character, but also your spaceships. So if you, if you start in the game without anything, and you get your first spaceships, even if then later you have a larger spaceship, you can keep the smaller one into the big mother mothership. That's the same thing for the crew. If you start with one or two members in your crew, uh, then you can have them in your big mothership later. Uh, that gameplay mechanic of uh, what we call the, you know, the Russian dolls, so bigger, smaller into the bigger, and then your characters, is very close to what we um, had in fact in Beyond Good and Evil 1, when the characters were getting out of the, the overcraft. So here we have uh, that monkey, which is my playable main character here, but of course you, in that game, in that, um, you can select your character and create your own character. Uh, just to give you a feeling of scale, that ship is about 20 meters long and the other one, the mother ship, is about 400 meters long. I'm going to go close to it so that you can see the size. So when we have large spaceships like that, the good thing, the interesting thing is that they are, they are um, a real level of gameplay. You can go inside, you, we have interiors for, the, for those big um, ingredients. So imagine I'm at the beginning of the game, I'm starting the game, 
I have nothing, but I am like, uh, you know, like in Beyond Good and Evil One, you start uh, without anything and you have to get some money to like level up and get, uh, get um, your first vehicles. So imagine I'm just delivering pizzas here. It's like a side quest or just a way among many to, to get some money. I'm delivering pizzas to those, uh, those guys. So imagine it's not my spaceship. That's the beginning of the game. And this could um, be an interesting way to trigger um, the first ingredients of the adventure because the spaceship is um, a playable interior. You can get inside, you can sell your pizza, and then instead of getting out of the ship, you could decide to explore the ship. And uh, why not discover that there is some slavery, some uh, human trafficking and things like that. The good thing is that in Beyond Good and Evil 2, uh, like in the, one, the first episode, you can uh, take pictures. So if, if I'm taking a picture of um, uh, evidence of the things I'm seeing in the game, then I can share those pictures with uh, the guys in the city, for example, and then we can trigger, I can trigger discussions uh, with those guys based on the picture I, I took. So that's a very interesting mechanic that, that, that can create that feeling that uh, you can explore everything and you can gather information and share those informations with NPCs, but also between players. Another very interesting thing here is the feeling of scale. Here we know that the players, that they, they will explore everything. They will want to go everywhere. So we need to handle large scale. Um... Uh, uh, okay, I, I know I talked about this during the E3 press conferences, but what is with this push to make all of our, like, our, our, our games, this, this weird hodgepodge of single and multiplayer? I, I cannot figure this out. The, this whole, like you said, it's well, it's between players. I'm like, no, stay out of my, stay out of my story mode. Leave me, it, let me play my story mode by myself, which I'm sure you can. And it, it, you know, it, it's just, I, I, I don't know. I just don't see the appeal. I, I don't know. Maybe it's just because I, I, when I play games, it's, it's more of a personal thing, not necessarily a social kind of thing. Yet it's also kind of funny because I'm recording. And putting it on the internet, but I digress. Uh, but overall, I, I I just have no clue. This guy has been sitting here talking for about four minutes, and he's doing something that I'm very good at, uh, although I don't do it intentionally. <laughs> but he, I really don't think he said anything. He's like, oh, well, look at the scale, and we have these ships within ships, and you can explore the inside of them. And, you know, oh, well, there's side missions to get money, to buy equipment and whatnot. Um, I, I thought that the first Beyond Good, I, I didn't, I, I don't know. I, I need to, I guess I need to go back and play the original Beyond Good and Evil. Uh, but it's just, I, I don't know what this game is and he has not said word one about it. Mm. Um, ingredients, uh, like, like that huge statue where you can go very close to it and you can, uh, look at all the details on the statues and of course you can go inside of that this kind of statue and you can also get on top of it i just want to show you something interesting about the scale and the feeling of scale so i'm going to land on the top of the statue and you will realize how big it is so here we have a wonderful vista and I want to show you, so I'm going to go more in the developer edition mode where I can move the, the camera very easily and you can really notice and understand the, the, the feeling of scale when you look at that little monkey on top of the big statue. This is just a part of the head of the statue and you're already very small. And it's very interesting to understand the scale of things. Here you see that the statue is really, really big. It's, the statue is about 700 meters high. And the very interesting thing, again, is that, in fact, that statue, which is big, is uh, just into a big city that is very small, in fact, compared to the continent here, the size of that uh, big island, and which is a small part of a big planet. So you realize that uh, you are just a little dot on that big planet, which is, in fact, just a small planet around a bigger one, which is a small dot in the big universe. So when we started that technology, 
we thought that we needed to uh, handle that feeling of scale and uh, in a realistic way. Before uh, going into details, uh, we wanted to make sure that the, the engine was uh, capable of handling this kind of thing. When you look at this sunset... Uh, okay, that, ju that just feels like he just... That was the longest, round, most roundabout way they could talk or, or, or that he could say that, all right, it's a massive open world, there's planets to explore, but, da, 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 you know, and again, I keep this, like, free-flowing, oh, you can just lead the atmosphere of this planet, no load screens, whatever. I, again, I, and I, I hate making this comparison, but I feel like we... I feel like gamers got burned when No Man's Sky came out, so I'm constantly on the lookout for stuff like this, and I, and I hear that, oh, well, you know, it's a social environment where people can meet other players, and they can go in and out of all these planets and exploring, and I'm just sitting here going, something just, it, it, it sounds too good. You know, it, 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 so, it, just, it sounds too good to be true. It sounds... Just, I, I don't know, just kind of like a small alarm bells go off in my head. I can't tell you exactly what it is. It's just something about it just uh, it just kind of robs me in the wrong way. But uh, the the original point I was making was just, it, just tell us that it's a big game. Because, I mean, it's quite obvious this is a large game. It's just, uh, I don't know. It's not exactly a sunset made by, uh, made by artists. It's really the combinations of uh, physical... Uh, ingredients, you know, the light that is changing depending on the atmosphere. So you can see here the different colors. And the fact that, of course, the planet is rotating around in space, around the big planet. So here I'm doing a kind of time lapse. I'm modifying the, the time so that you can understand better how it works. You see that everything is turning like in, you know, in a real solar system. So yes, I'm increasing the speed. You see the night here with the cities. So another important uh, thing is that you can, at any time, you can go everywhere. So if I'm going into uh, another city, there is no loading and things like that. Everything is seamless because it handles that big universe in a consistent way. There is no, no sheet. Or Again, just it. It, does it not sound too good to be true? Does it sound like you've got to be cut in corners somewhere? Because it, I, uh, I don't know. It's just something about it. Just, it just really, just kind of makes me go. Mm. Tough things like that. You can really uh, appreciate the point of view wherever you are. It will be the same mechanics. So that was one of the big feature uh, we wanted to make sure that we had before showing the game to the public, to everybody, so that we, we wanted to make sure that the technology was working and uh, this big ambitious game was uh, feasible. I'm going, I'm, go back, I'm going back to my spaceship. I want just to show you some gameplay ingredients. I'm going to change a little bit the time so that we have a bit more sun, yeah? So that spaceship is very, very nice. It, it's very close to the Beluga we had in Beyond Good and Evil 1. It can handle very large speed, but it's, it's also very easy to uh, do loopings and uh, trigger very fast movements. So it's a dogfighter. I can increase the speed. So this is a classic uh, plane speed we have on Earth. We are about 1,000 kilometers per hour. But you can increase that speed dramatically, like this, for example. And you will see, the, so the speed is increasing now. You see that it's about five thousand kilometers per hour. Let's go back in the city so that we can really understand the speed. And I can increase the speed again. Whoa. Use some tricks, movements. And then we are going to do a looping, for example. So you can combine anything, any movements. And the very nice thing too is that you can even increase the speed to 20,000 kilometers per hour, which is a lot. I'm going to try, yeah, to drift like that. So at any time you can, you have the drifting mode, you have the, uh, all these, these very interesting movements. But of course, the, 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 the biggest thing you want to do in this kind of uh, situation is to go in space. So let's figure higher speed. 
And you see this little effect around the spaceship is because of the friction of the, the atmosphere. If I don't increase my speed, uh, there is no reason to have more friction. But if I'm increasing the speed, you will see that the effect is stronger. And same thing if I'm going very, very fast. So depending on the quantity of uh, atmosphere, you can have a stronger effect. Until you start burning. But you see, with those very high speed, you can really travel very, very far and very fast. Just changing the time of the simulation so that we can appreciate the wonderful view in space. So if I decide to go on this planet or the satellite, which is somewhere around there, I can, I can go there seamlessly. And the more, uh, the further you are uh, of the planet, the, the faster you can go because there's no more atmosphere, so no more friction. So you see, here I still have a little friction. But of course, you can go back onto the planet whenever you want. A very interesting um, thing, too, is that there's a lot of biomes on the planet like this desert, or uh, you have frozen lands on the planet, different cities. So we don't want empty uh, planets. We want planets with landmarks, with uh, places to explore. There are mountains uh, where you have some monks living there. So they are not empty, uh, repetitive planets. The, the planets we aim to, to, to work on, to, this, to, to, to make our, our planets with life. And the planet uh, itself uh, is living somehow. For example, that planet has different, uh, different, I would say, big biomes. Uh, because that planet, as I told you, is a satellite of the bigger one, the one that is in the foreground, a part of that planet is um, protected. Like, you know, like the moon. Our moon is, uh, a part of the moon is protected by Earth uh, from the, the big asteroids and uh, meteorites. So here, that's exactly the same thing. The cities are built in the safe place where nothing is falling from, uh, from space. But I will show you a bit later the opposite part of that planet, where you can have real-time uh, giant meteorites, asteroids falling and modifying the, the planet's ground. Uh, the very interesting thing is that this, uh, this kind of event is connected to the life on the planet, so that uh, yes, you've got those cities on the safe place, but once the big giant meteorites are falling on the other side of the planet, then you have the big companies that are sending the slaves uh, on those very dangerous places. And a lot of slaves are dying, trying to gather um, the meteorites uh, goods, you know, the, the, all the, the things that are falling from, uh, from, the, from space and crashing. They are taking those uh, rare materials uh, and risking their life. So it's not just about the planet on, on one side and the, the story on the other one. The planet and the story are connected. And um, that, that's a very important thing for us. So again, uh, let's, let's look at that uh, planet modification process. OK, so now we are back on the, the other side of the planet, the side that is uh, bombarded by meteorites. Here, uh, we just want to showcase the ability that we have in the engine to modify the whole planet in real time. So here, for example, imagine that you're flying over that um, region. You can have a huge meteorite falling in front of you, uh, and you will have all these, this one incredible effects uh, on the planet, but also on the other spaceships. So that's a very important feature for Beyond Good and Evil. We want interactivity to be the heart of the whole experience, not just with character, not just with spaceships, but also with a big, huge planet. So thank you for watching that, uh, that video. This is uh, our first Space Monkey um, debrief. Many more will come, and we would love to have you um, leaving us your comments on this. <coughs> Sorry. Um... I, I, again, I have one massive, well, I mean, I, like I said, I mean, I, I have those, like, kind of alarm bells in my, in my head going off, going, mm, I'm getting a No Man's Sky vibe that they're making a lot of really cool promises, but what's it gonna do? Um, I, I feel, I, I sort of feel that, 
Nah, never mind. I'm, I'm not. I, I was about to say Mass Effect Andromeda, but no, Mass Effect and Mass Effect Andromeda kind of did what it promised. Like I, I don't like. I, I think I think just people expected more, but eh, that's a different argument, or that's a different discussion. This game. And, you know, and, I, and again, again, it's and, and I'm not a huge fan of all this, like, oh, open world and freely talk with other players, whatever. But the thing that my, my issue with this in-game engine demo, whatever, they didn't show he didn't show anything of the game. Like, like, that's the thing. I, I, I don't like these. Oh, you know, I'm just like, don't call it an in-engine demo, just, or I guess in-engine demo, it is technically an in-engine demo, but you didn't show anything, you didn't show combat, you didn't show actual gameplay, you didn't show, uh, basically what we will be doing in this game, because I still have no clue what this game is about, what will, what we will be doing, the concept, the objective of who these characters are, none of this has been explained yet. And, 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 and I just feel like that would be one of the first things that you kind of come out and talk about and not this kind of stuff. This kind of stuff seems like mid-development or way, like, far down the road uh, before release. It, it, I I don't know. I, I mean, it bothers me, but this, it's a it's a personal level. I, this is a personal um, thing. This is not a, um actual content of the game. Uh, the actual game, I mean, it looks good. I mean, it, it's really interesting, and I'm very interested in it. Yes, I know. I say you know, I'm saying interested a lot, but no, I I, I am very. Uh, th this game has kind of piqued some curiosity in me, and um, but again, I I want to find out more, you know. But we're <laughs> I hate these videos that just it feels like we're not being told anything of mass importance. So yeah, right, moving on. Uh, this is for uh, a new game. Uh, this I've actually not heard of this game. So a Plague Tale Innocence. Gameplay impressions. Well, I mean, uh, gameplay impressions is the part of the name of the article by uh, Joshua Yell. Yell. I, I have no idea how to pronounce that. Um, I I could not find the actual gameplay demo, so we're gonna read this and kind of watch the. You know what? We'll watch the teaser trailer first. Heretic! God judged you, and I am your executioner. What's that? It comes from the rats. Don't touch it. Inquisitor will give us a reward if we catch the whole family. Get him up! Get him up! Ah! I don't like this. Hey, what's that noise? Stay close. Oh no, no, no. Amicia, stay close to me. I think we're in the Spooky. All right, let's see here. Uh, set in France, or the article reads, set in France during the Middle Ages, A Plague Tale Innocence is an action-adventure game where a young sister and brother must fight to survive both the Inquisition and swarms of hungry plague rats. While the hands-off demo we saw was proof of concept and won't be featured as in the final game, uh, it left a strong impression with its dark atmosphere, intuitive puzzle design, and warm relationship between the two leads. It's also sure to haunt your dreams with a scurrying, disease-infested rodents. Um, like I said, I could not find a video of the uh, actual gameplay. If somebody, if somebody can find it, um, send me a link in the description. I'll do a video of that when we... Um, yeah, when we when we get there. Uh, article continues. Uh, you control M M Amicia? Uh, yeah. 14, uh, whereas little brother Hugo, 5, accompanies you and acts as an assist, an assist character. Sorry. The objective of the demo was for Amicia to rescue Hugo from some inquisition some Inquisition soldiers, and then locate their mother. The obstacles in your way are lantern-holding soldiers and swarms of rats that hate the light. So right from the start, it's clear you'll need to play one against the other. Uh, Amicia isn't a fighter, uh, so she must get by on her wits by launching stones with her slingshot from a safe distance. Uh, she can destroy soldiers' lantern, allowing the rats 
to close in and eat him alive. After freeing Hugo, the pair enter the nearby church after hearing a call from their mother. The area provided uh, proved to be a more elaborate puzzle that required multiple moves to get to the altar on the other side of uh, a swarm of rats. Even though it's fairly easy to stay clear of the rats, at least in this zone, the sounds of... Their... <clears throat> God, I cannot... I, I don't know, I, I, I have trouble, like, getting an unbroken streak of words. <laughs> the sounds of their squeaking and scratching are a constant, unnerving reminder that death by a thousand bites awaits you should you screw things up. Hugo proved to be pivotal here because he can fit into small spaces Amicia can't uh, reach, in this case, to find a torch. A few lit brazers and a slingshot throws later, and all the obstacles were cleared to a lantern that allowed the duo to progress. This is where things took an eerie and chilling turn, as the altar led away, uh, led way to a long tunnel lined with bones and hundreds of human skeletons. The rats refused to follow, and there was no sign of life inside, save for the call of dear mother off in the darkness. And that's where the demo ended, leaving me with a sense that the game, that this game has much more in store than meets the eye. Uh, both the visuals and characters were impressive. The mood, the moody setting was sharply rendered, and excellent looking character models. Jeez and the sparing use of light created an ominous environment for all the puzzle solving. But, it's the caring relationship between Amicia and, H and Hugo that really won me over. Their dynamic formed that tender heart uh, to this macabre game world. Uh, a, pl a, bleh, a plague tale innocence story will last about 10 hours. Creative director David Didine, hopefully that's correct, uh, <laughs> um, create, whatever, that guy teased that Amicia's uh, toolkit will expand later on with a bit of crafting, giving her new ways to deal with guards and rats. Uh, the, re the release date is still uh, to be announced, uh, published by Folks Home Interactive. It will be available on PC, Xbox One, and PlayStation 4. Um, really neat kind of game. Um, obviously, you know, the set in the, like I said, set in the France in the Middle Ages. Not really, I can, not much I can say about this just because I, I don't have a firm look at the game i all i can do is go off of what we saw right there in that teaser trailer um and again i'm, I'm gonna say the thing that i always say it, it, it this has piqued my interest this is a really neat concept um and i'm usually not into games like these i'm i'm, I'm usually not uh interested by these kind of um i don't want to say narrative based games but these kind of i i'm kind of into big dumb action you know, I mean, I, I like some I like some dumb action in all my games, but um, this one seems a lot more cerebral, and I'm usually not super into those games. Uh, but this one has definitely kind of caught my eye. Very, um, very interesting concept. Let's move on here. Um, Crytex Hunt Showdown is a multi-genre monster hunter article by John Ryan of IGN. <clears throat> uh, this is a game that I have not heard word one about uh but kind of reading this article it really actually kind of um is interested me um i i haven't seen the gameplay yet we'll watch that uh, that demo um when we get we'll also watch the 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 uh teaser trailer um but a big thing i just kind of from reading the um the article here something that i really kind of that i'm getting the vibe off of that this is um kind of an evolution of what we see um i'm trying to think here uh kind of reminds me a little bit of uh left for dead there we go all right now uh, the article reads i'll be honest and say that i was not expecting the coolest thing i saw at e3 to be a multiplayer shooter but it was even though calling crytex hunt showdown just a multiplayer shooter is a massive understatement hunt uh is an inter God, an intricate blend of survival horror, team exploration, and dynamic open world horror, with just a pinch of a roguelike, uh, a, with just a pinch of a rogue light RPG thrown in to boot. Uh, and the spooky hodgepodge looks fun as hell. Uh, set in, well, you know what, seeing that it's here, we'll watch. Wait, do we gotta play through the advertisement? I'll talk. Or, I'll read, whatever. Uh, set in the late 1800s, you'll play each match, which allegedly lasts anywhere from 15 minutes to a half hour, uh, though they could probably go longer. As a, let's see here, as a professional monster hunter contracted to banish some foul evil that has crept, 
uh, into our plane of existence while the lore may seem a little fast and loose at this stage it's a great setup uh, for us to be dropped into the murky louisiana swamp that serves as the play area and i quote it's not a very pristine environment we're going into end quote uh explains dennis schwartz uh, one of the lead designers on the project referring to the to the more romanticized versions of london or america or american cities we so often see in games set in that time period and i quote we're not going where everybody else is going in that era we're going into the swamps uh, let's show the teaser trailer oh. Once you land in the dark, brackish walls. I need to refuel. Sorry. Once you land in the dark, brackish waters, the basic gameplay loop is simple. Get in, find a monster, kill and banish it, then get out with your bounty. The real difficulty comes from the fact that while you're exploring the roughly square kilometer map, you'll also uh, be fighting lesser beasts like zombies, giant leeches, and more. The most interesting was some poor soul who'd uh, essentially become a living hive for bloodthirsty giant mosquitoes, as well as everyone else in the match with you. Uh, in our demo, The Power of Hunters, you can play in teams of two or on your own, and the matchmaking system will put you into matches with up to ten players uh, spent the first half of the match quietly avoiding any other players they saw in the swamp. Not that this was a requirement, obviously, there were plenty of gunshots ringing out across the map, and our hunters even came perilously close to an, ex uh, an explosive dust-up between multiple teams uh, while raiding an abandoned supply store. Target monsters are, random, are randomly decided every time out of an available ro roster of monsters and, and dynamically placed at one of the 15 potential locations across the fixed map, uh, which range from dank bogs and swamps to thick woods to open fields and farms. And I quote, we experienced in the past uh, with the procedural... God. Damn, I cannot read, guys. With the procedural stuff with Gilded Age, Schwartz said, referring to the, random, uh, to the randomized tile-based maps of the initial version of Hunt that we saw in 2014. Uh, and I quote, In the end, we went back to what we can do best, which is handcrafted levels. Even if, you're, even if you've been to a similar location before, there might be a very different encounter there, end quote. Our hunter's target ended up being a giant spider that had made a nest in an old barn. And it was one of the most terrifying game arachnids I've ever I've seen in recent memories. Instead of a slowly aggroing, instead of slowly aggroing like a standard giant spider boss, this one behaved well like a giant fucking spider. The barn was dark and dilapidated, and the creature would skitter into and out, um, into out of. I feel like there should be an and there. Into, out of, and around our flashlight beams. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> using holes in the walls uh, to quickly escape after surprise attacks. I'm sorry. Like, sometimes, like, I get, like, a break in my reading, and it just, it, something just doesn't sound right to me, and I have to, like, focus in. Sorry. I'm, I'm probably driving people nuts here with this one. Uh, once you do kill the creature, you'll have, to, you'll have to banish it. Banishment is a process that takes around 1 minute to 90 seconds. Uh, and during that period, every player in the game is made aware of your exact location. If you can survive the countdown timer, you'll be presented with an uh, extraction location, reach the gateway wagon, and you'll receive a huge payout of cash and XP. But if you die, don't expect to be getting up anytime soon. Hunt Showdown features, features permadeath, sort of. If your hunter gets killed while on a mission, that's it, they're dead. All of their skills and abilities plus any weapons and gear they had on them are gone forever. That said, that doesn't mean all of the time and energy you've invested into them was done in vain. The game uses what is what it calls a bloodline system, basically a lore-friendly way of, refer of referring to your player profile to manage your player level, bank the experience that you'd earned, uh, before getting killed and recruit different monster hunters as needed. You might lose a hunter who you played with for a long time, but the XP you earned with them will allow you to hire a new hunter with a higher level whose base stats are much higher than the previous ones. Different hunters will have different starting bonuses too. One might come with a powerful sniper rifle or have the ability to dual wield pistols, and you can equip and send them into missions as you see fit. Considering, uh, Consider it this way. If in-game 
you're playing as a hunter assigned to that one contract when setting up your bloodline you're managing a monster hunter you're managing a monster hunting agency it's doubtful we'll see a final version of Hunt Showdown anytime soon that uh, the team has said information regarding public casting is coming soon, but that could be anywhere from next month to a year from now. Regardless, I'll definitely be keeping an eye out uh, for any announcements, especially if it means I might get to, to squash that giant spider from for myself. Um, okay, this, this is what I get when I, when I skim articles. I knew I wanted to talk about this, but this is what happens when I skim articles and like I said, just kind of getting the basic vibe of this game, I, I was getting a um, Left 4 Dead vibe. Now, uh, now uh, let me change that. This is more um, objective-based. I really, I, I, I have a game. There's a game. This reminds me of a, of a game that I just cannot think of the title of right now. And can't even give you the actual description of the game. It's really bothering me. Uh, but that's because I'm just completely crazy. Don't worry about it. Uh, but no, I mean, this, this, this concept is very interesting. I, I really like the, that idea of the bloodline, how it's basically like, um, whoa, what am I thinking here? Uh, how it's kind of like managing kind of like a monster hunter hunting agency or whatever. Cause I mean, I, I get the basic concept that it's, um, oh, the, you know, your guy dies, well, you can have other backup hunters or whatever, but you lose that one particular hunter, that's, you know, but, uh, the whole lose your, all your gear and all that, that kind of, uh, I'm not a massive fan of that, but that's because I suck at multiplayer games, so, you know, um, and I, and I'm probably, uh, just, I'm explaining this in the worst possible way, uh, so let's watch some gameplay to get a proper look at it. Let's see where I come over here. Uh, hold on a second, I'm gonna look at a map. We are very north. Uh, let's just go south and look for the spider there. So if we could try looking at the building up ahead. There's some grunts and some armor. There are guys there. in that hut. There's ahead. a lake. There's a flashlight, I saw it in the windows. Hold on. Be very, very quiet. There's and some turn off your guys out there, some like this. Let, let's go with us. Dude, 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 you're way too visible, man. Get some cover. Are they shooting? Are you shooting? I'm not shooting. They're shooting at something, but not that. They're shooting at the at the guys in the uh, at the guys in the lake. Let's completely ignore them. They're out there. I. Okay. That's at east. Yeah. yeah. Shoot. Are you coming? Yeah. Just a sec. Yeah, yeah. They're very much busy with those guys right now. Let's get out of here. Let's go to the fire over there in the distance. Yeah. Hold on. Down fire. It's not at us, it's somebody else. I think it's far away. That must be the same guys from the cabin. Yeah. There's a bunch of dudes here. We try to take them out. Let's see if we can get across here and see if we can get to the other guys. Take out a couple of these guys. Do you see anybody? I see three, four. There's a whole bunch. Okay, if you shoot. Okay, you know what? I'm gonna light him up. Shoot him. How many are there? Many. Okay, there's a... There's... Okay, we need to go. Ah. Ow, ow, ow. Let's get away from that, because they must have seen us, man. Yeah, the whole map will hurt that. Let's go around them and see if we can get uh, up here on the line thing. We are around. There's a ground ahead. There's a ground ahead of us. I'll take him. Or, no, you, I'll take him. Okay, I see a track of him, a track of the boss. He's in the, to the north, just around the corner. You take him out? Don't. That's about a knife. There's another guy in the guy. bush there. I'll take him. Don't hey, shoot buddy. him, don't shoot hey. him. Hey. I go down here and look a bit. Okay, it's in the house, it's in the house here. Do you watch the area a little bit? 
Yeah, okay. Okay, it's in it's in uh, the room. You have to go through the door, and I think it's in another room. It's in there. A bunch of dudes. A bunch of dudes. Uh, I go in and. I have a fireball, so if you kill them, I'll okay, kill okay, 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 let's connect with the boss. Uh, spider, uh, barn, hay balls, on the roof or something. Be done by now. Uh, Did you say hay balls? Hay balls. I'm pretty sure it's hay bales. Balls. That's, that's what they're actually called. Hopkins pig farm, let's just go. Yeah, we'll go and check out those hay balls. <laughs> it took a load a bit. Let's just go, we'll go faster around here so we don't get trapped here. To the right. So the uh, resupply center is over okay, here. I'm right behind. Okay. I'm right behind. Um, so if when we get in here, um, we will have very, very obvious silhouettes. Everyone. So let's take it nice and carefully. I want to go in and get in there and get out as quickly. I'm right behind you. Let's follow the tree, tree line here a little bit. Careful. Come on. You go first. Mm. I'll watch you. I have to run in on my own. Thank you. All right, let's get the hell in there and um, get the stuff and get out. Actually, this one I have already. Get it? I hear gunfire, I hear gunfire. There are guys very, very close here. I don't think they're don't shooting at anything. us. That was a bomb. Yeah, that, they're fine. Okay, there are two teams, basically. I don't know, two, two, three hundred meters over there. Oh, are you? Up there, okay. It's burning, somebody's doing something over there. On the plus side, if they're fighting each other, it means that they're not going to be fighting us. So why don't we swing Let's around? get, okay, I mean, we're almost there at the pig farm, right? So let's just get there. I see it down here. It's down here with the fires. Yeah. Let's just get on. Let's, let's just get on. Swing around a little bit more uh, wide. So Are you shooting? We had Somebody's duties. really close. No, I'm not shooting. Okay, let's, okay, 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 I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. So I would try to avoid them seeing you. There, 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 there. Okay, good, good. Let's go here. Good. Fast, fast, fast. There's dudes in front of us. And there's... Dogs to the right. Take the dogs out first. Do you watch the zombies then? Yeah, I'll watch the zombies. We got them. Just coming out. Take the zombies, take the zombies. We have a hive. He's coming out. Where's he coming out? Do you have him? Yeah. Oh my god. Shoot it, shoot it, shoot it. Down, down, down. I'm bleeding, I'm bleeding, I'm bleeding. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Quick, 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 the other guys are still behind us. Keep going. There's a meathead. I don't see if there's, there's some leech here. Somewhere. There's a few left, yeah. Leech is on the floor. Let's just move in. Let's move in. All right, man. Spider's gonna be in here. Seems to me a little bit far away. I go up the stairs. Or do you go up the stairs? Ah, uh, okay, he's right here. Oh, get him! Get him! I got someone hit. See him at all. Back corner. Get him, get him, get him, get him, get him. Shoot, 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 shoot. Dead, you got dead, him, dead. perfect, perfect, perfect. Cool. Alright, uh, get banishing. I'm starting to banish. Okay. Check the map. I'm just checking out all the entrances to shut. Alright. Everybody will see where we are now. We're gonna get here. Dogs, 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 dogs barking. There's a guy coming in the uh, southwest entrance. 
Is that zombies or, or dudes? That dudes, that definitely dudes. Uh, I would have I'd like to oh. I see everything. Okay. They're engaging zombies right now. I don't know if they can actually see me. Where, where are you? I'm out on the balcony. He's shooting back. I think there's two teams, by the way. Uh. There's a zombie in here. I'm dead, I'm dead. You had to roll on me. You had to roll on me. I come in. Where are you? Up, up. I'm up, uh, at the bottom, at the bottom. Quick, 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 quick. There was a... I think I killed a zombie. I'm not sure. Okay, there was a guy coming in from my side. Uh, I need to bandage. I'm almost gone. I see him. He's in the center. He's dead. One dead, one dead. There's one more. Okay, bandaging is almost done. We are ready to move in one second. Let me hear my little... Try to get his friend up. Okay, he's in hell. Right, let's go. You I got gotta, it? I gotta pick up the bounty. Alright, let's go. Du -du -du. This is a player, this is a player, this is a player. You should, you should submit him, let me kill him. He's down, he's down. Quick, quick, the other guys are still behind us. Alright, let's get going. Yeah, somebody, sh somebody shoots at us. Throw a Constantina bomb off. There are there's still anything you got left. They're still behind us. Anything behind you got left? Uh, I got a... Just go, just go. Run, 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 run. Okay, okay cool. Here. I got three rounds left. There's an exit point here, come on, come on, come on. Cool shots, shots, shots. Somebody's still shooting us. Try to keep uh, off to the side. Go, 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 go. Wow. Um, I, 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 I didn't pause on that one just because I, I was so just kind of... Just kind of taken in by that... Um, and kind of the atmosphere of the game. Um, again, another game that's really that's really kind of caught my eye. Uh, and again, I usually don't get caught by multiplayer games, but this one actually seems really cool. Like I like the time period. Like I kind of like the western, you know, the revolvers and the shotguns and all that old school shit. But I kind of like the I like the element that the that the two man teams kind of bring in the fact that there's like three or four, you know, like three or four teams and then all of these kind of random enemies, you know, that I, it, my, my big question is, is it a race to collect your bounty or can each team, if, if each team wants, can they just ignore each other? Um, that, that's, that's my big question. Uh, but definitely, definitely this is a game to keep your eye on. It is a very neat concept. Uh, that gameplay looked, um, I mean, it looked rough, but it said pre-alpha footage, so, you know. Um, but de definitely, definitely keep an eye out uh, for Crytek's uh, Hunt Showdown. Uh, moving on. Uh, this was a game that wasn't shown at E3, but we have uh, apparently a leak showing that uh, Shadow of the Tomb Raider uh, shows Laura might be coming to America. Article by uh, Connor Sheridan of Games Radar. See here, uh, Laura Craft's next adventure was a no-show at E3 2017, but another leak has given us further reason to suspect it will be named Shadow of the Tomb Raider, as well as a strong hint at its next at its new location. NeoGaf user Neo Raider spotted the following logo uh, treatments under a previous work uh, section for the video game marketing firm Takeoff LA. They're no longer available on the site. Uh, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, uh, Shadow of the, you know, all those, uh, boom. See here, um, you might recognize the image in the bottom, uh, on the bottom, most logo from, um, Jesus Christ, what is that? You might recognize the image on the bottom most logo, okay, I'm sorry, I, I was not reading that correctly. You might recognize the image on the bottom most logo from Rise of the Tomb Raider, but it's, uh, common to reuse old assets for the early stages of promotional design. Uh, definitely seems like the name, uh, will be Shadow of the Tomb Raider in any case. Here's the really interesting part this stuff. Uh, these, these illustrations show Lara doing her usual exploring, skulking, uh, wound bandaging routine, uh, but look at where look at where she's doing it. Many of the images depict what appears to be a Mesoamerican step pyramid, you know, like um, Chik, uh, Chichen Itza, well, that's correct, uh, in thick jungle veg vegetation. It looks like Lara's next stop after the fictional island of Yamatai in the Siberian wilderness will be the southeastern Mexico or Central America. Uh, she might be able to fashion her own wooden spear too. Maybe firearms will be a bit harder to come by this time around. Uh, Lara will... Uh, Lara, how do you keep... any? Uh, whatever. Words. 
guy being cute. Um, uh, again, this is all leak. As far as I know, none of this has been confirmed. Uh, this is a fairly new article. It came out, what, uh, yeah, about 14 hours ago. So, um, like I said, I, I don't trust leaks implicitly. I mean, most of the time these leaks end up coming out that, oh, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's real, it's true, but uh, again, I, I always say keep, it just kind of keep the possibility that this is complete bullshit. Uh, but overall, again, um, we know that there's going to be another Tomb Raider game. It, it seems about time, because what, it's been... When did Rise of the Tomb Raider come out? It was about two years ago? No, last year. It's only been a year, jeez. Um, so, yeah, I, I'd, I'd say we're probably coming up around the time that we might... Uh, be hearing that uh, another Tomb Raider is in, that is in the works. Like I said, I mean, from the end of Rise of the Tomb Raider, we know that there is a um, uh, that there is going to be a sequel. I'm not going to spoil Rise of the Tomb Raider. If you want, you can go check out my Let's Play of it. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm I'm excited to see where the series goes. I love I I really like the series all the way through. I, I know some people had some problems with the first one, but I I actually liked it. I like the concept. I like the characters. I like the setting. All that I I, I really dug it. So uh, moving on. Uh, something else. This is from um the UB blog. Um, <laughs> this is um apparently it's five ways guns for hire. Change the Far Cry experience, E3 2017, by Michael Reparaz. I'm horrible with names, guys. See here, <laughs> Boomer the dog. I like that. Let's see here. Uh, the article, the po whatever article, whatever. Your buddies in Far Cry 5, scenic Hope County, Montana, are unique count are unique characters with whom you'll forge alliances over the course of the game. And once they join you, they each bring something unique to the table. Having them around adds new dimensions of strategy and possibility in Far Cry 5's uh, anar oh god, I cannot anarchic anarchic is that right? Anarchic. I, I for some reason. I, for some reason, that word doesn't sound right to me. A uh, creative approach to gunplay, destruction, and exploration. Here are a few things um, to consider going in. One, they can scout for you. Boomer, the fangs for hire of the E3 demo, is a cute dog that everybody loves. This means uh, that they won't really take notice or attack if they see Boomer, and you can command him to slip into areas with heavy, with heavy enemy activity, nose around, and tag enemies so that they're easy for you to spot. You can also command him to retrieve guns from dead enemies, which comes in handy if you're low on ammo and pinned down by enemy fire. That reminds me so much of Far Cry 4. Well, that's... I'm not going to say that's where they got the idea, and I love the Voss bobblehead, but it, I don't know. It just, it reminds me of Far Cry 4. Uh, once the shooting does start, Boomer won't shy away from the fight. He can take down enemies uh, just as capably as any gun for hire. He's also more durable than you might expect. After uh, my first few encounters with Eden's Gates death squads, uh, he was still raring to go, only to go down when I accidentally hit him with the blades of a rotary tiller. Fortunately, he responded shortly afterwards, so I didn't beat myself up too much about it. Uh, they create new tactical opportunities. Uh, Grace will follow you in any danger to watch your back from nearby. But as an expert sniper, she's at her best when providing overwatch. Keep your eyes peeled for any high places or hiding spots. And if you see someone you want to ambush, order her to a nearby perch or blind and start calling out targets. She'll also cover you from afar when you're in the thick of it and in a situation where trouble can come from any direction and small squads can turn into small crowds if someone sounds an alarm that's invaluable. Let's see here. Uh, they can add immerse firepower to your arsenal. Uh, Grace's covering fire can 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 take down enemies in a hurry, thinning their rigs uh, so you can deal uh, with them more easily. But if you'd rather not uh, deal with them at all, consider calling in Nick Rye for a tactical airstrike. Once he joins your side, Nick will fly overhead, providing air support and safety from the skies, calling a strike and on an Eden's Gate roadblock, however, and he'll buzz down and strafe them with machine gun fire or drop a bomb that will damage, if not destroy, anything and anyone blocking the road. Uh, they'll, they'll change your approach to combat. I really... Liking the look of the cars in this game. 
just because all the ones in the previous ones just look crappy. This one, these kind of look cool. Uh, when I started the Far Cry 5 demo at E3 2017, I initially fell back on familiar tactics that had carry me through Far Cry past. Uh, charging into danger with spraying rifle fire any, at anything that moved, and then sliding behind cover and desperately tossing at sticks of dynamite when my first approach near uh, nearly got me killed. And while that was and while that was fun, I soon learned that I could have done so much more. And with each partner I employed, my approach uh, to the world and enemies I encountered changed. With Boomer, I got a lot more cautious, partially because I thought he was much more fragile than he actually was, but also because he gave the, me the biggest advantage when I took it slow. He, uh, had him scout and stealth killed uh, cultists with a star-spangled baseball bat. That's awesome. Grace made me mindful of rooftops and other high places. I can order her up to uh, and in a pitch, grabbing a sniper rifle and taking up a position next door. Let us both quickly uh, make... Let us both make quick work of cultists trying to occupy the town of Falls End. Uh, Nick, meanwhile, made me... Hold back for different reasons, bombs, when I saw cultist roadblocks, uh, which pop up frequently throughout the demo. Uh, they usually consist of one or more vehicles and a, com and a complement of cultist guards. I'd tag it and run for cover within... It bit my tongue. Within seconds, six engines, roar, blah, 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 blah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Like I, I know I'm just going through this. I'm trying to uh, cover multiple angles. The demo of E3 uh, kept things relatively straightforward by making players choose between Nick, Grace, or Boomer. Things open up uh, some instructions some interesting strategic opportunities giving you um yeah i mean again i mean this isn't necessarily anything massively new i think we got to look at that in the e3 demo um but I, I i wanted to cover this just because again it's just I, I like getting a little bit more um facts from people who have actually got it in hand um uh, but again uh, far cry 5 looks sweet Really excited for it. I'm really liking um, the guns for hire, the fangs for hire thing. Um, and personally, when I saw when I saw that priest uh, in kind of like the character intros, like I'm curious what he's gonna be, like what his like character like. Because I think all of them are gonna kind of serve different purposes for different kind of kinds of gameplay styles. Um, I was kind of hoping that the priest though would be, um, oh god, uh, was it like Leonidas or whatever from Far? He's in Far Cry Four, I think. It's the guy handing out the handing out the guns. I think that was Far Cry Four. I'm I'm I for some reason that he, I feel like he was in Far Cry Three though, but no, I think he was in Far Cry Four. Either way, for some reason I really wanted that character to be him, but then as soon as I heard him talk, I'm like, oh wait, no, totally different guy. I was I was thinking, did he you know come to America, start like expanding his ministry, and stop being you know just batshit insane? But no, nah, I no. Nah, Unfortunately, moving on, <laughs> more E3 news. Uh, apparently, the Uncharted series likely to continue after Lost Legacy, says Naughty Dog, by Jeff Scrubbles IGN. Despite releasing Nathan Drake's last game, Naughty Dog seems keen to keep up uh, to keep the world of Uncharted alive. Speaking to Eurogamer, Uncharted The Lost Legacy creative director and writer Sean Eskeg, I have no clue how to pronounce that, said that, uh, and I quote, to say that the Uncharted world is done, I doubt that highly. Uh, the upcoming Lost Legacy is a standalone game featuring return, uh, returning side characters from the series and, uh, poignantly, uh, definitely not featuring Nathan Drake in any capacity. Uh, Skag uh, seems to... It seems to see that approach as a useful one for the future of the series. And I quote, I wouldn't say it's the end. Uh, this thieving world is huge. There's so many characters. Even before we settled on Lost Legacy's uh, story, we were exploring uh, Sullivan. We were exploring, uh, exploring Cutter. It was in the third game. Uh, and... Uh, pairing each other uh, up, thinking uh, what would be right, uh, what would have conflict, growth, something new, something fresh, and Chloe was uh, the one that kept jumping out. Another possible direction, uh, end quote, another possible direction for the series uh, is hinted at uh, by Uncharted 4's epilogue chapter, although we won't spoil that for you here, just in case. We'll see how a standalone approach uh, works when The Lost Legacy arrives on August 22nd. Uh, it impressed the city, three, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, about 10 hours long. Okay, that's actually a fairly decent length for standalone DLC. Um, now, I'll, I'll, I'll timestamp the spoiler and when it starts and when it ends, because I'm going to spoil... Uh, you know what? Screw it. Spoiler alert for the end of Uncharted 4. It's been, what? A year? It's been over a year now. I'm talking... Well, no, it's actually not been a year yet, but... Yeah, whatever. I played the game on the channel. You, you should have played it if you haven't played it yet. Um, the end of the game, Nate and Elena obviously finally get together. They hopefully stay together this time. 
and they have um, a daughter whose name is actually escaping me right now. Um, same name as his mother. We find out in four, and I can't think of what it is. Um, either way, we find out Nate and Elena have a kid, and, you know, it's the idea of the future. We'll see that kid branch out in more Uncharted games. You know, I, I always kind of thought that we'd see this. Uh, I remember hearing about, oh, Uncharted's done. Uncharted's, you know, Uncharted 4's the last one, and I'm sitting here going, no. It's gonna, it, it's gonna, it, this is gonna be the last Nathan Drake game, but it's gonna, it's, it's gonna, I, I'm sure if you go back enough in the weekly shows, whatever, uh, you'll, you'll catch me saying that, yeah, I, I think the series is gonna continue on, uh, with different characters. Yeah, moving on. So, uh, Call of Duty Modern Warfare Remastered Standalone PS4 release confirmed out next week. Uh, by Alex Gilyadev, IGN. Call of Duty Modern Warfare Remastered will be available as a standalone release for PS4 next week. Activision has announced the game, uh, which was previously only available with Call of Duty Infinite Warfare Special Editions, can be purchased both physically and digitally on PS4 starting June 27th at $40 US, along with the full campaign, and will include the original 16 base maps. Uh, while initially only available on PS4, a standalone release for other platforms will follow sometime in the future. Uh, Activision's announcement uh, follows recent leaks suggesting the remastered title uh, will soon be available as a standalone box game. In celebration of Modern Warfare's uh, remastered standalone launch, players will be uh, able to compete in a five-week seasonal event called Call of Duty Days of Summer on June 27th. <clears throat> the community celebration uh, will include XP events uh, in game giveaways, a new summer-themed map uh, for Modern Warfare remastered, new gear, and more. Uh, we award Modern Warfare... Uh, 8.5 last year. Uh, it's an outdated classic uh, excerpts from the review. And uh, Call of Duty WW2 still waiting to see how good that's going to end up being. Um, I'm not going to say go out and get this, whatever, because honestly, and I'm going to say something super unpopular, nobody likes it when I say this, I didn't like Call of Duty Modern Warfare. Really didn't like it. I, I don't know what it is. I've gone back. I've tried to play it multiple times. Well, I mean, I've played it. I've completed it. But I, I just... I do not see the fascination with it. So many people keep telling me how great it is. It's still to me, I've said this multiple times, my all-time favorite Call of Duty game was Call of Duty 2 Big Red 1. It was a phenomenal story. Loved it. And again, I know I'm talking... It's a first-person shooter, and I'm talking about the story. Yes, to me, games are... Games... I, story, it takes precedent over everything to me. Um, but to, I, I, I just... I, I have zero interest in a Modern Warfare remastered. I just put it in... I put it in the show here just because I thought people would like to hear about it. So, yeah. I have no real comments on that. But uh, I, guess, I guess it was obviously going to happen. Um, now, here, here's a game... Okay, well, first, the, the title is Become Human Will Launch in 2018 Quantic Dreams. Uh, confirms, <clears throat> article by Alex Osborne, IGN. Now, I'm, I'm waiting for them to announce, to, to, to make another, uh, show another trailer for this game. And its concept completely shifted again. I mean, like, the idea that it's about these, like, androids or whatever has kind of been a, a common theme. But I remember way, I want to say two, three years ago... We got this kind of like weird CG demo for Detroit Become Human or this concept. It was like a uh, playing as Kara or something like that, like a freed AI robot, whatever. And then last year's E3, we saw it was kind of like a, um, which I mean, I'm, I'm assuming this one's also going to be kind of, you know, from the, the trailer and whatnot. It's still kind of like your kind of your choose your own adventure kind of deal. Um, but last year was kind of like, FBI. It kind of reminded me of the movie Surrogates. If anybody's seen that, it's a horrible film. Um, <laughs> it it is actually a really bad movie, but it's actually but it, it, it's still it's one of those that's a bad movie. It's fun to watch. Either way, it kind of reminded me of something like that, uh, but still with this kind of it's set in Detroit. You're like an FBI agent with like cybernetic implants, or maybe you're full blown cyborg. I I don't know, but it, it's just it. And now it's this year, this like radical. I don't want to say terrorist group, but you're this kind of radical movement. I just, I just cannot figure out what the hell is going on with this game, and I, I I'm, I'm waiting for them to change it again. It just, it'll make me laugh. Let's see here. Uh, Quantic Dream's upcoming PlayStation 4 exclusive Detroit Become Human will be released sometime next year. Game developers David Cage confirmed the release window in an interview with GameSpot at E3, saying, "Ib," and I quote, "It's going to be next year." 
Detroit Become Human was shown in E3 last week, and we got a chance to see a demo that centered around Marcus, the, re, uh, the recently revealed third protagonist of the game, who's played by Grey and, Grey's Anatomy star Jesse Williams. For uh, our thoughts on the Android Focus Adventure, check out. Okay, there we go. There we go. I I I I think I okay. So so what we saw last year, I'm guessing, is still the. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, oh, well, well, watch this. I don't think I've... I don't know, okay. I've not actually seen this, so we'll, we'll go watch this. Okay, but this makes so much more sense now that it's going to... Uh, that he's one of the main characters. So this is going to be kind of like... Um, Heavy Rain, where there was like the three or four main characters here. All right, well, of course... I fuck's wrong with me quantic dreams heavy rain beyond two souls i actually like i actually like beyond two souls so that explains to me why I, I just thought they kept changing the concept year after year after year but no okay so uh, all right i i understand now and the entire me starting with that makes me sound like a complete and utter jackass uh, and sometimes it, i don't want to make it sound like i don't read these articles at all before i you know, start talking, or, you know, bring them into the, you know, just start doing the show, because I do read them, it's just that sometimes I skim, um, in haste, sometimes, um, I, you know, I, I, I get a basic concept, I just don't, uh, read the entire thing, and then I, you know, so I read kind of a couple paragraphs, and then I miss a big thing like that, and I end up talking myself into a corner and make myself sound like an asshole. Oh, well. People are trying to wrap their mind around because these are really very real questions philosophically and morally that people are facing now in the world and, and in the next 10, 20, 30 years. I mean, I feel like you guys, I think you added, I think you knew that this was all coming together. It built it right into the story. Yeah, right. Well, I was not the first one to see it. I was really um, uh, inspired by a book called Singularity, Singularity is Near by Ray Kurzweil where he described his future in which, you know, human intelligence doesn't evolve much, but machines, they have an exponential curve in how they progress. So there will be a point in the near future where there are two curves we're going to cross and they will become more intelligent than we are. And what if beyond this point, they will start to feel emotion and start to want rights? How will we react? What will we do about it? Um, and that's a very interesting question. And it's fascinating to me, especially because I think this is going to happen. It's not sci-fi. The question is only, is it going to be 20 years from now, 40 years from now? I don't know. But there will be a point in the near future where this is going to be the case. Yeah, David, I know you spent a lot of time on the script. I think it totally shows just in the, in the little pieces that we've been able to see. How, from a writing perspective, did you go about writing all the different replayabilities? Because based on different choices you make, the game changes over and over and over again. I can't imagine how long that <laughs> script was and all of like the, you know, Option B, option C. How I have the I have the same question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I'm writing this kind of scripts for nearly 20 years, so I have some experience. But I must confess that Detroit has been by far the most complex script I've ever written, and it took me two years, which is quite unusual for me. It's a very long period of time. Final script is about 2,000 pages. It's really huge, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, in comparison, a film is about 100 pages. This is 2,000 pages, so you can imagine, I mean, the amount of work, all the, the, the dialogues, all the, co the, the conditions and the, the, the different branches in the tree structure. It's been really a nightmare to write, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> a beautiful I nightmare. I appreciate your honesty, <laughs> yes, though. Yes, we, we thank you for the beautiful nightmare. Yeah, how do, how do you try and find the focus? I mean, how do you always direct things back to the story that you want to tell? Well, the thing is that there is not one story that I want to tell. There are many stories that I want to tell. And I just try to create this narrative space. It's a little bit abstract, but I create a narrative space in which the player is free to evolve and to tell his own story. So you cannot tell any story in Detroit. There is still this narrative space over there, but you, you can really build your own story based on your actions and face the consequences of your decisions. But we play also with motion capture cameras. So we have an, uh, a shoulder camera and we motion capture the movement of the camera just to have a real feel, to have the breathing of the cameraman and the steps and all those things. It's small details, but it makes a big difference in the end. Totally. I completely yeah. agree. All right. I, all right. So let me just say one thing. The, the hostage negotiation 
it's just rife with tension all the way through. And I was actually telling Malik earlier in the day, one of our other hosts, when you become a parent, it changes the the what's at stake in that scene. And I know that you are, you know, a parent as well. And I just writing that sort of scene where a child's life is at stake and the tension is just racked up really high. I mean, yeah. how do you kind of play with that emotion, but still keep it kind of in line with the story that you're telling? Well, it's uh, a lot of work. And, and to be totally honest with you, the very first version we had of this scene, the little girl was older. She was maybe 16 or 17. And we felt there was something wrong. I mean, we couldn't really connect and we didn't have the sense of tension because she felt like she was an adult. And of course, her life is at stake and it's important, but it was different. And um, there was something missing for me in the scene. And we just decided to do something simple as to have a younger, a little girl, because suddenly it becomes very interesting. She becomes very vulnerable and uh, her feet don't touch the ground. It holds it like, it holds yeah. her like, like this. And there was a cable on set so he could hold her with one arm. Oh my God. So the, the little girl who shot this is, uh, was nine years old, I think, uh, on set. And she enjoyed that a lot because between <laughs> each take, we had to swing her all over the place. And she loved it. But Well, that makes me feel a little better. Yeah, I'm, I, yeah the yeah. tension has dropped a yeah, little bit. Yeah, no but... kid was killed during the shooting. Okay, okay? I, I certainly hope oh, yeah. not. <laughs> yes. All right, right there, there's the... Um, the the face of the the original character Kara, and there's the FBI agent. Okay, so this makes a lot more sense to me now that I that I know that we're seeing mul that this these are a multiple um, character kind of narrative. Now I know a lot of people absolutely hated Heavy Rain. I actually liked it. I thought it was cool. The ending was a little odd, but I mean, like I understood the concept and everything. It's fun. Again, I liked Heavy I liked uh, Beyond Two Souls, but <laughs> that's just me, apparently. Uh, but no, Detroit Become Human. I, I'm seeing a lot more gameplay in this than I usually see in these sorts of these sorts of games. Um, I mean, granted, I'm not with the controller in my hand, you know, so maybe it just looks that way. But it actually looks like there's some gameplay. It's not just we're along for the ride, and I only need to hold my controller for small quick time events or to choose a direction to go. It there actually seems to be gameplay here, and I'm really interested in that. I said interested and interesting. It's one of those like you you try and get the word out of your head, but uh, it just it, it doesn't go away. Oh well, I mean, you know what? Um, I was going to talk about this, you know, this game, this this thing with Cliff Blazinski, but you know what? We're at, holy shit, we're running at an hour now. So this this has been a really long show. So I'm actually going to cut out this Cliff Blazinski article. Um, actually, you know, I'll, I'll open that one back up at the end, and if you would like to, uh, read it, I'll put it down in the description below, um, so you can read it. It's a, it, it's an interesting article, it's, I love Cliffy B, um, currently working on the multiplayer shooter, uh, Lawbreak, uh, Lawbreakers? Law, yeah, Lawbreakers, um, he, you know, uh, the guy behind, um, Gears of War, which, you know, one of my all-time favorite video games. Um, so, it, 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 it's a big thing with me, um. And I'm very, very, I, 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 I can't wait for uh, more, or, or I can't wait for more Club Blizzard's games. Um, but he's talking about just making some very different stuff. I'm sorry, I'm rambling here. Um, if, as you can see, it's still kind of early in the morning, um, and I'm actually about to get up, um, go play golf. So, <laughs> either way, thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, usually the show, I try and keep it down to about a half hour, but this week there was just a lot, a lot of videos, a lot of stuff to watch, a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. You can find me over on Facebook, Twitter, the website. Links to all those um, are down in the description below, along with the timestamps and links to every article that I've showed today. Um, or something else. Like, comment if you're not already. Please subscribe to the channel. This has been, like I said, I'll, I'll try and do better next week. This has been a kind of a odd, kind of staggered weird me video i'll try i'll try and like i said i'll i'm i'm still <laughs> reeling from e3 there's a lot of a lot of recording a lot of a lot of stuff so yeah well, thanks for watching everybody and until next time i'm aj gills this is the umthar gaming channel i'm out